This is That's Another Story Told, the podcast. The author, the narrator, the short story. Together they dance in your ears. This time brought to you by myself, Sarah Jane Rose, and author Martin Burns. We'll be hearing his story, The Perpendicular Tree, in a moment. But first, Martin, thank you for virtually joining me today. Ah, hello, Sarah. Thank you for having me on this podcast. It's a pleasure. So first of all, talk to us a little bit about what kind of writing you do and so- what sort of work you produce. Um, I always find that a bit of a... Really, yeah, it depends on what the project is, actually. I've you know written for the stage. Um, I have a couple of plays in... Uh, pre-production at the moment uh, and my university degree was in script writing for films so that makes me sound like a jack of all trades especially as we're talking about a kid's book um, and in fact uh, The Perpendicular Tree is uh, my first kid's book um, which was new territory. And did you specifically set out to write a children's story or was it just how it happened? The story itself um, came about while I was in the Lake District um actually and I went for a walk with my brother and his girlfriend and we came across this tree that um had been knocked over but it was growing horizontally so it was still alive um but it was kind of flourishing in the wrong way and I have just done that inverted commas sign of wrong <laughs> as in there you know there is no wrong way really if you're, if you're still alive and growing and um I was so taken by it that really just the story kind of materialised in my head instantly. Um, and it felt so kind of simple but powerful, that, uh, well, powerful enough that it just, it felt like a kid's story without me wondering what do I do with this idea. Um, and of course, because I was, you know, all the characters were already trees and flowers and nature spirits, which doesn't mean it's not for adults because, you know, I think we all remember the really good kid's stories. Uh, are also enjoyed by adults. Um, but the theme of it, of the story, felt like it's good for us to teach kids. It's good for kids to know about being outsiders, especially in these times. You know, there's so much division going on. Um, and I guess a part of me has always written about wanting to combat that division because, you know, I've I've lived as the other for years. And um, that's something that always informs a lot of my writing is um, being the other and and my activism that's tied up with it. Um, You know, I loved the idea that this tree was still growing, still fighting the good fight. It's, you know, it's tenacity. It's like, well, something's happened to me, but I'm, you know, I'm not giving up. And how did it feel to have your work turned into an audio story what did you think about that that process how did that make you feel um having your prose uh turned into or 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 voiced by a vocal actor was something i'd never experienced before it was a whole new world really um i've had actors read theatrical work but you obviously expect that whereas this was um a new experience for me and of course you know you did such a marvelous job that all the characters in the perpendicular tree went from all sounding like me because when you write something you know the characters are speaking in your head and the voices are in your head but they are all still you even if you put like a funny accent on it um so they all went from that to being these fully realized rounded um fleshed out uh characters that I had no idea were going to talk in that manner whether you know whether you gave one of them a a slightly Scottish accent or you made one of them sound really sly and mischievous I hadn't envisioned that myself and it was I mean it was a little bit like a eureka moment it gave me all the all the goosebumps everywhere I was enjoying my work so much more um you know I uh, I was sad at the sad bits and I was excited by the excited bits and that's not because I'd fallen in love with my work again. It's because I'd fallen in love with what a voice actor had done with my words. So that was incredible. And actually, as an exercise, I would say to um, every writer out there, 
uh, get something performed in an audio format just so you can hear it really is the most wonderful experience. Well, that uh, rather seamlessly uh, leads us into hearing the story. So thank you very much, Martin, for joining us on That's Another Story Told. Yeah, I hope you enjoy the story and thanks for having me on the podcast. The Perpendicular Tree by Martin Burns Read by Sarah Jane Rose What a terrible accident it had been. And yes, it had been a dark and stormy night. Isn't it always when some terrible accident happens? It happened last year. You need to know about that night, even if it is a little frightening. Lip Curl the Bracken had warned everybody there was a storm approaching, but most everyone chose to ignore him. Lip Curl the Bracken sometimes spoke the truth, but also sometimes didn't. Rain, rain, come this way, the winds will hit, the winds will play, beware, the storm arrives today. Some of the other bracken nodded in agreement. Some of them wound up tight for safety. Some of them stretched out, disbelieving of lip curl. One tree, our tree, remembered thinking, maybe it would be stormy, maybe it wouldn't. Either way, he would try to enjoy it but it was far too violent a storm to enjoy that night. All four winds had come together for their yearly party, and they blew and they shouted and they raged and they laughed, not caring that our tree was holding on to the ground with trembling roots with all his strength, hoping he wouldn't be pulled out. West wind, leave me alone, he called into the noise, but the west wind had been looking forward to this night all year. East wind, please go away he cried, but the east wind had forgotten how to behave properly. Norwind, stop doing that, he shouted, but the Norwind was on holiday, and you can do whatever you want on holiday. Sowwind, that's not safe, he yelled, but the Sowwind had decided he was going to cause as much mischief as possible. Then the winds joined hands to dance a circle around all the trees at the top of the hill. It was one last wild jig, one dance before they went home to their four corners of the world. Our tree was pushed to the left and pulled to the right. His branches started hurting. His leaves were being torn off. He could feel his roots being uprooted. Then suddenly, crack! The winds flew away, knowing they'd done wrong. Our tree had fallen down, and everyone had been around to hear it, and see it. Whenever a tree is looked upon, it knows it's making someone or something happy. Take a look at the nearest tree to you. Go on, take a look. How does it seem to you? It doesn't matter if it's tall or short or round or wide or green or red or leafless or full of flowers. All trees make people happy. Roots holding the ground firmly, trunk standing strong, branches playing catch with the clouds. All trees make us happy. All trees except one. Our tree had no name, partly because he didn't make anyone happy, but there was another reason. Young trees don't get given a name until they reach a certain height and a certain age. It's different for each and every tree species. Only when they're given their name do they find out what species they actually are. In fact, it was yesterday that Yellowleaf the oak had spent all the sunny hours laughing merrily because not only had he been given the gift of the name Yellowleaf, he'd found out that he was an oak. A young, strapping, king of the trees oak. To be fair to Yellowleaf, He'd suspected he was an oak for a few months now. This is not Yellowleaf's story, however. This is the story of our tree. He made no one happy, and he didn't yet have a name. He lived in the lakes, this tree. Really, he lived above them, a fair distance up a hill. Quite near the top, in fact. When younger, our tree had enjoyed the view, smiling at the far-off hills, 
He'd loved looking at the morning mist rising up from secretive valleys, even though the tops of some of the older trees sometimes got in the way. He had smiled at the view. He had smiled at himself. Not only did he not make others happy nowadays, he wasn't happy himself. He watched the animals that moved about freely and he was jealous. His eyes were already green, he is a tree, remember, but over time they changed colour. They became greener and greener. As lamb sheep danced on the rocks, as the gadflies played at being in time with each other, as the water sprites splashed in what little of the stream was left, and as the raw crows tried to hold a tune as they wheeled in the air. Even the doodars, which the tree had heard a human call the bluebells, and which gave him a rare smile, even they seemed to have some freedom. They waved one way when the west wind came by to visit, they waved another when it was the east wind's turn. All the time, ding dong, ding dong, such beautiful music from their water-coloured instruments. Our tree couldn't move at all. Even his leaves stayed limp and drooping nowadays. He knew all the winds, even the bad-tempered norwind and sow wind, were giving him a wide berth. Poor thing, bleated the lamb sheep when they weren't thinking about which dance to dance. Poor thing, called the raw crows, out of tune. Poor thing rang the doodars in their field of doodars, an oblong of such rich colour that humans came from all over the world to oo and ah over it. No one and nothing ooed or ahed over our tree. Maybe if he was happier they would. All the other trees in the lakes were happy, but then all the other trees were growing in the right direction. Our tree lies face down on the hillside. Half of his roots are still in the ground, but a half of them had been torn out of the earth. They stand in the breeze like dirty fingers waving to no one in particular. We know why he lives like this. The winds had never returned. They were too embarrassed, and so they kept their distance, pulling and pushing the other trees and animals, but with a softer touch. You will be told the story of how the four winds had a habit of running amuck another day, and hopefully before it's too late. Over time, all the woodland creatures became more and more confused. It was all too sad. What shall we call him? they asked. Nothing. He hasn't got a name yet. He's not tall enough, they realised. What shall we say when we talk to him? they asked. Let's not talk to him. It's easier that way, they agreed. So, all the other trees, and gadflies, and lamb sheep, and doodars, turned their backs on our tree, because it was easier. Every now and then, the sound of poor thing would drift across the hillside, but it was never spoken to our tree directly. There had been a day when our tree now accepting of his sadness and feeling lonely and somewhat afraid, had plucked up the courage to ask Letitia the Ash why nobody addressed him with a name. Until you learn to stand up, there'll be no name for you, she said snootily. Letitia was an old tree in the wood. She wasn't really trusted, and everybody who lived within eyeshot of her stayed wary. How could our tree learn to stand, though? He was just too heavy to pull himself up. He knew the other trees and the raw crows and the winds and the water sprites didn't love him because they didn't know how to talk to him. What could you say to a tree who spent his time lying the wrong way down and who had lost some of his leaves in the storm last year and who was shameless enough to wave his roots in the air like that? Life in the wood went on. It was too much effort to try and stand up, so our tree simply didn't try. He spent his days being irritated by the earwigs who walked along his trunk comparing their new hairstyles, and annoyed by the money spider who crawled into the underside of his leaves to have her wealthy babies, and irked by that one toothless adder who curled up at night in between his useless and exposed roots. Pesky spider, he thought 
wishing she'd deposit her precious cargo somewhere else. Troublesome earwigs, he thought, although the only trouble they were really causing was the tickling of their footsteps, which secretly made our tree giggle. Mischievous adder, he thought, thinking about all the mischief the winds had caused this time last year. Life in the wood seemed to continue on, without him taking part. Even a tree that wasn't from around here grew up and came to be loved. They called her Bugler, the Rodo, and she was lucky enough to be big and beautiful and confident. I am not endemic, yet here I have decided to belong. Our tree didn't know what endemic meant, but he also didn't care to find out as it sounded different and worrying and odd. So over time, our tree got sadder and sadder. You may not realise it, but you've probably seen a tree cry before. Their tears come in slow droplets of amber resin. It's a beautiful and slow way to cry. Normally, these would run down a tree's trunk, but as our tree was perpendicular, they would drop down into the shaded soil below. Ouch! An occasional worm would say as an amber droplet fell onto one of its heads. Thank you, a wandering beetle would say as an amber droplet fell on its hard shell, decorating it superbly. Our tree was especially sad in the evenings, when Bugler and Lip Curl and the other trees, and sometimes even Letitia, came together to talk about the day and sing songs, with the doodars donging their bluebells. The raw crows tried to keep tune, but eventually somebody would always have to tell them to stop singing. At bedtime, they would all say goodnight to each other. But nobody said goodnight to our tree, because nobody knew what to call him. It was a strange day in April, when an even stranger stranger came into the woods. It wasn't the first time for the stranger, but it was the first time our tree had seen her. She was called Odd Frieda. She was old, but she moved just as well as the water sprites, with a spring and a summer in her step, a jump onto a rock every now and then, and a walk across water when nobody was looking. She had manners, so she didn't like to make others jealous. She didn't know about our tree, and that he spent all day being jealous. His eyes were the deepest of greens now. Odd Frieda would sometimes dress up smart, but only if she were invited to the posher parties in one of the nearby towns. But as the humans never invited her any more, her clothing was never that smart. Her travelling cape was tattered at the edges, her walking cane was curved from too much pirouetting and prancing as she walked along, and her gloves only had nine fingertips left. She was never alone, though, as her companion posing Mary fluttered around her shoulders, darting off every now and then to drink the tastiest of nectars. They spent most of their days being pretty happy, unlike you-know-who. Odd Frieda had been walking for four days now. The last town she'd been in had been all right as towns went, but posing Mary had fluttered into the room they'd taken to share the news she'd overheard that morning. The townspeople want us out. And all because some good-for-nothing nosy bod had seen Odd Frieda rescuing a cat from a tree by using a simple piece of levitation magic. Well, the good-for-nothing fire sentries weren't doing a thing about it, exclaimed Odd Frieda. Posing Mary knew this argument wouldn't hold, so it was time to pack up and hit the road again. Bam! Luckily, Odd Frieda travelled light, so it took one quick minute to pack her bag. Star chart? water flask, diary, secrets box, and the last of her toffee and teasel sandwiches. She had stopped walking to eat the last of those teasel and toffee sandwiches. Odd Frieda couldn't decide which way around tasted better. Teasel and toffee, toffee and teasel. What she did know is that they tasted best when sat down. Get off, get off, get off, get off, get off, get off! Earwigs and toothless adders and spiders with bags of money were quite enough for our tree without the bottom of some crazy old lady to have to contend with. Oh, my apologies. I thought you were just a log. So sorry, she said. At the sound of the word log, 
Our tree shivered his leaves and his timbers both, for everyone knows that a log is a tree that is no longer alive. I am not a log, he said angrily, though there were days when he thought it might be easier. Posing Mary could sense an uncomfortable conversation coming, the type that took place when a mother was angry at her child's mud-covered shoes, or when a wife has seen her husband in town spending all their coin on silly knick-knacks. So, Posing Mary flew off in the direction of the doodars, hoping there'd be sweet nectar to drink. I'm not a log, repeated our tree, just so you'd remember what he said last. I'm very much alive. You don't exactly look like it, said Odd Frieda, settling herself on the grass nearby and taking her last sandwich out of its lily-pad leaf wrapping. If you're trying to hurt my feelings, you may, harumphed our tree. Everybody does it. I'm used to it. Then I'll do something different, thought Odd Frieda cleverly, fishing out a stray piece of teasel from in between her teeth. You're very unique, she said. Why'd you say that? asked our tree, a little less angry now. But Odd Frieda was too clever. No reason. Our tree's anger rose again. I might say the same about you. Now, why do you say that? asked Odd Frieda, scraping some melted toffee from the roof of her mouth. Many, many reasons, said our tree, trying to be both clever and mysterious. Go on, tempted Odd Frieda. Your clothes, for one. My clothes? They're not to your taste, tree. <laughs> why dress like everybody else? No one will be able to pick you out in a crowd. Good point, thought our tree, but he didn't want to say it. Well, you keep the company of a butterfly. We are friends and we help each other out. I can see all the flowers around, further than posing Mary. She gets tired quickly. She's very old for a butterfly. And then, when she flies up and towards them, she can see what lies on the horizon ahead of us. The only company you should keep is the company that helps you out and makes you happy. Good point, thought our tree, still not wanting to say it. Here's something. I've never seen you before. What are you doing here? I've been coming here for years, my dear tree, but I only appear on Good Friday and then unappear at Halloween. You've just been too busy with your face in the ground to look around. Good point, and true, thought our tree. He wasn't sure what to say next. But where are you from? Where do you go to? What do you do? And does it matter? said Old Frieda simply. Our tree thought for a second. Did it? Did it matter? He didn't know where the toothless adder came from to sleep. He didn't know where the earwigs went back to once the hairstyle show was finished. He'd never asked where Bugler the Rodo had come from somewhere called endemic, apparently. Even the winds, who were behaving much better recently, who knew where their four corners of the world's were? I don't go so far, hissed the adder, who was still there and knew what our tree was thinking. I leave if I'm hungry, which isn't so often. I've no teeth, so I can only eat Sleeping things. Do the other snakes make fun of you because you've no teeth? asked Odd Frieda cleverly. I don't know, and I don't care, he answered without a hiss. Another good point from somebody different, thought our tree. He was close to saying it out loud, too. He thought some more. All these good points that he wanted to agree with. Then why don't you agree with them? Our tree was finding this day hard to believe. Now Odd Frieda knew what he was thinking too. This was strange because sometimes he didn't know what he was thinking himself. But then she was a strange stranger. You should speak more what's in your head. That's the problem, he said sadly. Why? asked Odd Frieda. Because... I don't know what species I am. I don't even know my name. How can I be sure of what I'm thinking? 
I know what species of tree you are. The world paused. Water sprites stopped splashing, and the ding-dongs of the doodars stopped ringing, and the winds played statues for a second. Our tree lay perfectly still, a little frightened even, as Odfrida stood up and bent over and whispered in his ear. She whispered a name, and then she told him some more. I'm a sycamore, said our tree. Yes, indeed. I know I'm a strange stranger, but you're a little strange yourself, young tree. Usually you're kind as tolerant of the winds. Maybe you have a lesson for them. Yes, I suspect you do. And it might please you to know that you're also not endemic to this land, just like Bugler, yes. You two may become the firmest of friends. No, no, it's not a country. It means you're to be found in one particular place. Your kind originally came from elsewhere. So many of us do. All of a sudden, his leaves stopped drooping. He stopped looking at the ground and instead saw the stars up above, who were beginning to come out as they'd heard from the east wind that our tree had just learnt his name. I have a name. They all waited. And my name is... Asa. The earwigs and spiders and toothless adders all clapped in their own particular ways. The earwigs used their free hands, the ones not styling their hairdos. The toothless adder could only slap his tail against our tree's bark. But the money spider and her babies made up for it, each having four pairs of hands. What are you all still doing here? asked Asa, still rolling his new name around his head. Why, we live here, silly, hissed the adder. You're our home, said the earwigs. Thank you for keeping us safe and dry, thanked the money spider babies, who were as hungry as their mother was tired. It would be night time soon. See, said Otfrida, your friends are those that you help. See how they help in return. The spiders keep your leaves clean, the earwigs massage your bark as they parade up and down, and the adder stops any dirty rats from nesting inside your trunk. This is me, then, said Asa, though he didn't sound entirely sure. No, no. This is all of you. Us. This is us. The woodland and the hillside and the lakes and the winds and everyone who lived within or around or under or amongst. Everyone was as happy as Asa at how this evening had passed. I have to tell everyone else. You will. You will, said Otfrida, as posing Mary returned her furry belly full of nectar. But not yet. Enjoy it with your closest friends. You can tell those who are asleep another time. They'll be happy, won't they? Yes, and so will I be. Oh, for now, though, do you mind if I lean up against you and get some sleep? I might pirouette and prance like a young water sprite, but I do need a good long sleep. Come, come, Mary. He won't mind and pulling her tattered cloak across her, old Frieda went to sleep. Posing Mary stayed awake for a few minutes longer, as butterflies know all about what happens at night time. She knew what was coming. As if by magic, the earwigs and the money spider babies and the adder in need of a dentist all wished our tree good night at the same time. Good night, Asa. Our tree, Asa the sycamore, smiled, feeling very sleepy and not at all sad or lonely or afraid. Good night. Thank you for listening to Another Story Told, the podcast. We really hope you enjoyed the show. And if you do, then please subscribe because you'll get a new story every week. 
If, like us, you want to celebrate new authors and narrators, then please share this as far and wide as you possibly can. Maybe you have a story of your own that you'd like to submit. To do that, just look at the show notes and all the information you need is there. Thank you.